Yes, we are ready for the Android class, starting now. And uh, what you're looking at is socket programming on your screen, but that's what I'm going to talk about today uh, in terms of T U TCP and UDP done on the Android. Uh, so this is an Android lecture, believe it or not, although it's marked socket programming. Uh, so it will also give you a background in socket programming for uh, um, Java. Uh, application development as well. So this is all done. It's the same concept actually done on the Android phone. But before I show it to you on the phone, I figured it's probably better to give you the basic concepts. So in terms of socket programming, the goal is to learn how to build client-server applications that communicate using sockets. We can do thread programming and socket programming on the Android devices. Uh, so the socket API uh, is introduced in the BSD 4.1 Unix release in 1981, so it's the same socket release, same Unix um, information as you're familiar with already, perhaps. Explicitly created, used, and released by apps. So apps create sockets, apps use threads, client server uh, programs themselves, two types of transports that uh, work via the socket API, and that would be unreliable data, datagrams or UDP or reliable byte stream, stream oriented or TCP. Um, in terms of the concept. So the socket, by definition, is a host local application created OS controlled interface or a door uh, into which the application processes can both send and receive messages to and from other another application process uh, from another device. We've actually seen UDP sockets already. Um, it was implemented in our um, our, um, what do you call it, uh, chat program that I showed you a couple weeks ago, maybe, uh, by now. I know I showed it to you, but I don't know exactly when it was. It was a while ago. I showed you a, a client-server chat program, uh, but it was implemented using UDP, UDP and sockets, actually. So it's TCP is a concept. <clears throat> so the socket programming using TCP, the socket is the door between the application process and the end unit transport. So we have two choices. We have UCP or TCP, um, in which we're most popular using TCP. So TCP service itself, um, reliable transfer of bytes from one process to another. So it's controlled here by the application developer in terms of the process that's running. We create a socket, and then we have a TCP with buffers and variables that go back and forth via an internet connection in this particular case controlled by an application developer on this side. Actually, they're both. The host and the server are pretty much the same. And um, if you're in the Java EE class, we actually just went over this. Are you guys in the Java EE class? Yeah, so I thought some of you looked familiar. So I can kind of whiz through this because people are sitting here have already gotten this information before. <laughs> so there's a little bit of an overlap between this class and the, uh, the Java EE course. Uh, but I'll give you the stuff that's specific towards the Android environment, the phones, uh, or tablet devices. Um, so socket programming with TCP, the client must contact the server. The server must first request, or must first be running, hopefully. And the server must be created through a socket or a door that welcomes client contact. So the server's actually got to be up and running, ready to go. Same thing true for phone apps that work through client server as well. The server's got to be sitting there waiting for incoming clients, um, whether it's using UDP or TCP. And that could be a background process running on the phone, waiting for chat communication or waiting for something. Um, so creating on a client, the client contacts the server by creating a client local TCP socket, specifying the IP address, the port, the number of, server process, of the server process, and then the client creates the socket. And then so the TCP client's established connection is through the server that's running TCP as well. So when uh, contacted by the client, the server TCP creates a new socket for the server process to communicate, to communicate with the client, allows the server to talk with multiple clients, which is the reason why we're doing this. We want the server and the client to be able to communicate. And then the source ports uh, numbers are used to distinguish the clients. Um, we don't, we're not going to see this. We're actually going to see more of this in this lecture, not in Chapter 3, so you can ignore that comment. Um, so <coughs> from the application viewpoint, the TCP provides a reliable in-order transfer of bytes or the pipe between the client and the server. So you can get a pipe on uh, cellular phones and tablets as well because they are Unix boxes, if you think about it. Um, it's just as if you had two computers. In fact, the way that these phones are these days are as powerful as computers. Um, 
So two Android devices could be connected via a socket, and they could be reading a stream back and forth. Um, so a stream, um, this is the uh, vocabulary for you, is the sequence of characters that flow in and out of a process. The input stream is attached to some input source for the process, a keyboard, a socket, uh, something of that nature. The output stream is attached to the output source, the monitor, or the, or the socket. So if it goes through a monitor, it might, the output might be on a screen, or it could be going into another, you know, another phone or another device and communicating. You could use this for transferring files back and forth, or communicating via text message, for all sorts of different applications, actually. So in terms of the socket programming with TCP, as an example here, we've got the client server app where we, uh, the client reads a line from the standard input in from user stream, sends to the server via socket out to server stream, and we have multiple streams that are running for the TCP connection. So the server reads a line in from the socket, server converts the line to uppercase, sends it back to the client, the client reads, prints the modified line from the socket from the in from server stream. This is kind of a graphical picture of the way it looks. Um, so you have a keyboard going in, <coughs> which will give you the input stream, the monitor going out, or the display, um, or a socket going out to another client or another server. From the client TCP socket, you might have something going out to a network. You might have something coming in from the network, the input stream itself that might be going into a, a socket abstraction or a Wi-Fi from, from the server or something, or something coming in from the server. <coughs> so the client-server socket interaction, and this is an example of the way it runs. So the server and the client, you know, we put these guys on two, two ends here, and the server's running on a host ID. It creates a socket. And the port is equal to X. You know, for incoming requests, the you know, welcome socket is equal to the server socket. And then it waits for incoming connection request. So we have a connection socket, which is equal to a welcome socket dot accept. You know, accept something if it comes through. And then on the client end, you create a socket and you connect to the host ID. So you're coming back up this way, connecting to this host into this port. And then you're creating a socket as well. So you're basically creating sockets on both ends of the app, whether it be on the client or the server. And the client socket is equal to the socket. Here, to create a new socket object. And your TCP connection setup is the creation of the sockets. And the connection between the two sockets is made by the request sending the connect uh, with <coughs> a host ID and a port, you know, a port number. And then X is a number. Port, port number where the uh, server is waiting. So it sends a request using a client socket back to the server. And if you're on the server, it reads the request from the connection socket and it writes a reply maybe back and says, Hey, I got your request for a connection and uh, I'm going to reply back. So it writes the reply to the, the, the client on this end. The client reads from the client socket over here, closes the connection, takes the packet or, you know, takes the information, parses it, and then meanwhile the server might close or it might stay open depending upon whether or not it's waiting for more connections, depending upon the connection state. So if we were to write this in Java, it would look similar to this, where we have all these pieces of the previous slide here that went through all the different uh, communications between the server and the client. To put it in source code terms, where we'll be importing the Java IO, Java.net. And these are the same imports that we're going to use on the uh, Android phone as well. <coughs> and we have created a class TCP client. Oops. And uh, there's a main method in the class here. <coughs> there's a sentence. There's a modified sentence. So we have two strings that we're going to work with. And uh, the first string is going to be the buffer reader in from the user, create a new buffer reader from the input stream, so create an input stream. And then the socket, client socket, is going to be equal to a new socket from the host name and a port number. So it creates the socket, the client socket. This is the client end that we're, that we're looking at first. And then uh, the data output stream, output to the server is going to create an output stream from the string that we're going to use. So we're going to essentially put this string, one of these strings, inside of this data output string. 
So it creates the output stream attached to the socket. And then we create the input stream that's attached to us to the socket. So we have two streams, one for input and one for output, as we saw. In fact, this is the same similar example, a little bit broken down, a little bit in more detail than what I gave you in the Java EE course, but very similar in terms of its nature. Um, here the buffer reader is uh, going to be the information that's coming from the server in the input stream. The sentence is going to be a, you know, read a line from the in from user. Uh, so it's going to take this buffer reader string that's stream that's coming through to the server and it's going to read the lines and, and add it to a string which is going to be the sentence, uh, the, one of the first variables that we created. And we do that because it's compatible in terms of its all string information. So the stream is carrying character bytes and strings and all, everything that can be converted to a string essentially. And then to send the line, <coughs> send the line to the server, out to server dot write byte sentence, you know, write the sentence out and put a line return at the end of the sentence. And the sentence is essentially what we read in. To modify the sentence is going to be the in from server dot read line. So it reads a line from the server, and then it's going to print to the screen from server, and here's our modified sentence. It's going to be this is some something that was sent from the server. And then we're going to close the socket connection. So for the server, it's going to be very similar, except for instead of sending something to the, if you're a client, you're going to be sending something to the server and then waiting for the server to send you something back. In this particular case, you're going to, we're going to create two strings as well. And we're just going to open up a socket. So we've got server socket, welcome socket. And we're going to go into a loop. So, and we do, we do the same, actually the same kind of concept on the, if we had two phones that were connecting together using this protocol as well. Which is kind of interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so if we go while true, which means just go into an endless loop, essentially the socket connection socket is equal to the welcome socket dot accept, which is basically saying accept something from the socket. So it's waiting uh, on the socket to accept something. And then the buffer reader in from client is equal to the new buffer reader, new input stream reader connect socket dot get input stream, which is going to get the input stream from the socket put it in the buffered reader so we can read the line and copy it to the string essentially. <clears throat> so create the output stream attached to the socket here we're using the data output stream. So data output stream out to clients is going to be equal to a new data output stream and then the connection socket dot get output stream. Run that method on that connection object to get the uh, whatever is coming in from the uh, client into the server. And so the client sentence is going to be uh, doing a read line on the in from the client um, or a buffered reader that we have set up. And then now uh, we have a capitalized sentence, which we're going to just take it, run a two uppercase to it, change all the lowercase um, characters to uppercase, and then print it out. So out to client, write the bytes, capitalized sentence. So it took the input from the client, capitalized it, and now it's going to send it back to the client. <clears throat> so write out the line to the socket. So and then we have the while loop over here. So end of the while loop, look back until another client connection exists. Now if we're going to do that on a UTP, and this is actually kind of a good review as well for the Java EE people, the TCP has opened up two streams, an input and output stream, and we're working with string data. And <clears throat> we have a server that sits and waits, and we have a client that connects, and then you know, in our TCP example, we're disconnecting. But there's no reason why the client has to disconnect. The client could sit there all day and wait for more messages to come in, you know, sit there. The server could sit there as long as it wants to and exchange information with clients as well. It doesn't have to close the connection as soon as it finishes. UDP, however, closes the connection <laughs> every time. It's almost, it, and then UDP is more of the chat messaging or uh, discussion board slash chat messaging slash um, data exchange between applications. So socket programming with UDP, there's no connection between the client and the server, but there is a server that waits for a client connection. Although there's no constant connection, there's no handshaking, the sender explicitly attaches the IP address and the port to the destination to each one of the packets. So the packets are self-identifiable. And we don't have a stream anymore. Um, in terms of the TCP, one of the advantages is having that streamed data that we can 
um, you know, manipulate and use as a string, essentially. In the UDP, we have datagram packets, and those datagram packets include a lot more information than the stream data uh, because they need to be self-identifiable. You need to have the port and the address. So the uh, <coughs> server attaches the IP address and the port to the destination on each one of the packets. The server must extract the IP address, the port of the sender from the receiver packet. In the UDP transmission, the transmitted data may be received out of order or it may be lost. It's the reason why they call it UDP is because it's unreliable data transport, data protocol. Where the TCP is reliable because it, there's a handshake that goes on, there's communication that is established back and forth between that client and the server. From an application viewpoint, the UDP provides the unreliable transfer for groups of bytes or datagrams between the clients and the servers. Good for text messaging. So what would the exchange look like between the client-server socket interaction of a UDP communication? Well, we'd have a server that would load up, kind of the same as the TCP server that loaded up running on a host ID. We would create a socket. This part's about the same, actually. <coughs> for the incoming request, create a socket. But here we're going to use a server socket is equal to a datagram socket. It's a slightly different format of socket. So you can easily tell what protocol you're using by the type of socket you actually create and you bind to the ports. Um, everything else is pretty much the same. It's the same process. You're just using different objects. Uh, so you must uh, read the request from the server socket which is that datagram socket. And then from the client's perspective, you see that the client creates a socket as well, datagram socket, the same type as the server. And then uh, it creates an address using uh, the host ID and the port number. And it sends a datagram request to the client socket, using the client socket to the server. And then you, re you have a re you know, read the reply from the client socket, essentially. And then wait you know, excuse me, write a reply to the server socket, specify the client host and the port number and send the uh, reply back to the server, excuse me, to the client. So you might notice that there's less communication going on in this exchange than we saw in the previous example with the TCP connection. So the level of, um, the level of uh, exchange is very um, uh, optimized for the, for the application. So on the client end, the end piece uh, was the closing of the client socket. And then here the execution comes back up and it just is ready to receive information from the server socket again. So it just kind of sits here and this is where the loop would come into place in terms of waiting for the next client to show up. So here's an example of the picture of the giant of the giant picture of the Java client on the UDP transport. From an out perspective, it sends a packet TCP sent byte stream. From an input perspective, it receives the packet from a TCP received byte stream. And uh, the client process itself, you know, looks the same as before. In fact, it is pretty much the same picture as we've seen previously in this lecture. Um, where we're taking input from a, a network or from a, a port, from any type of connection. And we're using the socket to bind the information to create the datagram packet. And then we're taking those datagram packets and we're reading them. So, If we were to implement this using the Java source code, um, this is what a UDP client would look like. And uh, it's pretty similar except for uh, we're using datagram socket now. So we create the input stream using a buffered reader again. <coughs> we have the datagram socket which is going to be the client socket. So create a client socket using the datagram socket instead. Um, we can translate the host name to the IP address using a DNS lookup if we want to. In that particular case, we can get the name by running it on the network address you know, and the net ID, um, which automatically gets it from the information from the socket. So net address, IP address is going to be equal to the net address get name from the host name. Um, which is a great way of, of just getting the uh, location. <clears throat> and then uh, here we're putting bytes together because we're going to put them in a datagram packet. We're not going to send a stream. Instead, we're going to create a byte array, and we're going to hold the data for the send data and the receive data in two byte arrays. And then we have a, a string for the sentence, which is going to be the same from the buffer reader. We can read in, in from the user.readLine. 
to, to go in from, um, you know, whatever input the, the reader, or excuse me, the client wants to send to the server. And then the send data is the sentence.getBytes. So turn that into bytes, essentially. And then we send the bytes in terms of the socket um, for the datagram information. And so <coughs> we create the datagram, <coughs> and we call it a datagram packet. And we have two of them. We have the uh, send packet, and we have the receive packet. The send packet is going to be a new datagram packet with the send data, the send the length, the IP address, the ports, and we got this IP address automatically from the system. So it was kind of a kind of a nice way of um, automating the process a little bit. Um, so we create the datagram packet with the data to send, the length, the IP address, the port. We send the datagram to the server by doing on a client socket, and we do a method to send, and we send the datagram packet, which is going to be our parameter. And then uh, the datagram packet, receive packet, is going to be equal to the new datagram packet, receive data, uh, which is going to be the data that's going to come in. And then the length of the data, how many bytes is this included in the data so we can parse it correctly. And then we read the datagram from the server by doing a receive, receive packet, and the receive packet is also of the datagram packet format. And then we can have a string that we can create called a modified sentence that's going to be equal to that data that we've got from that datagram packet. And then we can print something to the screen, essentially. The server, and you might notice that this is a, um, a little bit less code than the TCP connection, um, maybe by about five or six different lines, maybe short by about five lines or so. Uh, it's because it's not quite as complicated. Uh, we don't have to create two strings. We just have one. So. We don't have to worry about an input and output stream. We're using the same uh, socket to essentially send and receive. From a server perspective, we create the datagram socket. So the datagram socket is going to be server socket, new datagram socket with a port number. And we take and we have two byte arrays to receive the data to send the data. Same thing we actually had on the client. But then on the server, we've got the, the while loop, essentially, while true, which means cycle waiting for client connections to come in. And uh, on the datagram packet, we have a receive packet and then the length of the packet that we're receiving, which is kind of similar to how the client received the packet as well. And then we do a server socket dot receive, receive the datagram packet to receive it. And then uh, we can create a sentence, a string sentence to be equal to the new receive datagram, get the data from that, and then uh, we're going to extract the IP address, so we're going to get the IP address port number of the sender from the, uh, <coughs> you know, from the receive packet, because the packet itself is self-explanatory. It has the port, it has the sender, receiver, it has all the information on it, so we just pull it from the packet. So we don't really even know if that client is still out there. The client could have gone away, uh, but we received a piece of data from the client. We may not even have received that piece of data either from the client. It may have failed getting to the server. But let's say it didn't fail and it made it. The server has no idea if the client is still around. So it's going to essentially sit there and process and pretend like this and then send it back out to the client, assuming the client's still there. So, Which is how things have actually have to work when you're talking about a phone-to-phone -phone transfer of information, exchanging data. And you can easily put this together and have it running on an Android app and have an Android server and an Android client and talk back and forth, uh, which is uh, kind of fun, actually. But it's the same thing you would be doing if you wrote the Java source code into little um, commit console applications and ran it from a computer and opened up two console windows. So it's pretty much the same effect, actually. Um, except for you can incorporate this into a, an application. We're going to see that in a few minutes, how to use UDP and TCP with the Android APIs. Um, but to finish our background here, <coughs> we're creating a uh, diagram packet, a send packet. It's going to send the information with the port number and the IP address that we've received. And then we have the, the end of the loop that's going to loop back and wait for another diagram packet to arrive. So it just sits there waiting for diagram packets to arrive. One arrives, it processes it, and then it waits for the other. So in terms of the implementation in Eclipse, you open up a Java project, not an Android one for these examples, just a regular Java project call it EDP client, extend object, copy the code into the web, you know, in the in the website here, inside, which is from the PowerPoint, I should say. Run the program, modify the program to read two sentences and print two answers or something, or do something, and then repeat for separate projects. So you have to 
Actually, you don't want to use them both together. You'll want to create a separate project if you're going to try and sample this out with TCP and UDP. In terms of programming references, these actually um, are pretty good references, especially as well if you're going to be, um, if you're in the Java EE course and didn't get the UDP TCP stuff, you missed that lecture. Uh, this is different. This is a diff these are different uh, sources as well. And they're still around, um, even though the numbers are kind of increased over the, over the years. The tutorials are still around. So they put out some good socket programming tutorials, essentially. So that was the base information on socket programming for UDP and TCP. So let's see now how it works with the Android. So this is Hello Sockets. <laughs> Hello world for sockets on the Android. And you'll see, and I, I recently I ran into this slide set to give it credit. It's from 2011, so it's, it's actually fairly new. Uh, excellent tutorials. Um, sponsored out there as open source. Um, and at the end of this, there's a, you know, there's, well, there's credit done on the bottom, but it's, it's this group. Um, I can't remember the name of the group right now. I was going to give credit where credit was due, and I can't remember <laughs> at this point. Uh, but I ran into this resource and I went, well, these are really good PowerPoints because they're topic by topic and they're um, essentially, you know, coming out with some pretty interesting applications and then, you know, if I mix them in with basic information and you'll kind of get the round big picture of these concepts. So, hello socket programming with TCP and UDP. So the goal would be to convert the socket, Java socket programming project to Android. You know, one of those, we just looked at one a few minutes ago. Actually, we looked at two. We looked at a client and a server for a UDP and also a TCP. All that stuff can actually be converted to Android projects very easily. Um, so here's a program here that says to server, and you've got a little text window where you can take as input the information that's coming from, and then let's say this is the client. We have the client here. And uh, the source of this program, as we're going to go through on an example, would actually do both. And the source code I just gave you a few minutes ago will work just fine uh, in terms of uh, what to put for these method calls, or for these button clicks. So hello nets <coughs> to the server. You would type the text in here. So uh, text input from the user sent uh, to the server as before, same as before. And from the server, we would take a label and we'd put out uh, something that came back from the server. So the answer from the server would show up in a label. So what we're really doing is just changing the GUI interface, essentially. And then um, sending the input from the user to the UDP server using the UDP button, and then sending the input from the user to the TCP server using the TCP button. So in terms of the layout, creating a simple layout, including uh, the elements for the edit text, the text view, and the buttons. So this is the edit text, the text view, the buttons um, that are part of the simple layout. Register one of the on-click listeners for each of the buttons. So you register an on-click listener. We've actually seen that in, in a couple of other examples so far as well. Test the functionality and make a toast for each one of the listeners. So you know when the listener has caught an event, like they receive something from the server receive something from the client and you put out a toast message essentially which would be good for troubleshooting as well. So in terms of the socket programming you're going to define most of the variables as members of the main activity class so this would be in the main activity same as what we've been doing before we would be uh, renaming the datagram socket client socket datagram socket to UDP client socket you know, so that we could have both of them and not have to use the same words. Because if you look at the uh, previous example that I just gave you, the two Java programs, this is what it's modifying. And uh, both of them are using the same client socket. So we would have one that said UDP socket, we'd have, to have another one that said TCP socket. Because we're going to have two buttons, because the program is going to do both simultaneously. <coughs> so the socket client socket would be renamed to socket TCP socket in this particular example. Uh, so adapt the code from pure Java to Android by specifying the input and the output streams by filling in the two on-click listeners, uh, which actually is a direct translation. There's nothing you have to change with the code. 
you would still be importing Java IO net. You'd still be making a datagram socket and report. Because if you go back and you kind of look at that, there was no UI to it. It was just basic um, create a port. I mean, excuse me, create a socket, bind it to a port, um, have it listen in, create a loop. And so you would actually have the loop. You have all the code from the non Android application working in the same way. In terms of handling exceptions, it's going to be slightly different because you're going to have different information coming in from the, from the Android environment. Many network operations throw exceptions as they can fail. Uh, usually they do fail from time to time. In the original code, uh, they were just thrown out in, uh, out in main. So in Android, we have to handle them so that we can actually deal with the exceptions that might exist. So we could perform a try and a catch as an example. And the try, try we go, you know, we use the word. In fact, this is the same exception handling you would do in Java using a try and a catch. In fact, I believe I showed you this in the first object-oriented programming in Java class. It's a basic exception handling. So the operations that may fail and uh, that would essentially throw the exception would be in the try block. And then in the catch, we'd have the exception. And then we, you know, in this, this is a little different. This is logging it to the, the debug window, to the DDMS window, so we could actually see the error message come out. So we would write from a log.e from an exception, write out, you know, create, create the tag, caught a UDP exception, and then whatever message came out of the exception from E that was handed to it, we want to get the message on, the, on that. And then we would write it out. So if we had the log window open and we were testing those two, you know, the client and the server running on the, on the Androids, or, you know, in the emulator. If not in the emulator, we'd be able to see the debug message and troubleshoot the debug message from a real runtime environment. But uh, for testing purposes in the beginning, um, to log the information makes a lot of sense, actually. And this is a pretty easy way of doing it. And then we could write a toast message out to um, say that there was a UDP error. And, that, uh, and here's the error. I'll show the error message that came out. So if we keep the log, then we can go through and see the chronological sort of like this happened first and that happened second, and this happened third, or maybe it only you know produces an exception every five times or something. And maybe we're accepting that as the unreliable UDP or something. So in terms of running it, first give the application internet permissions. So once you give it internet permissions, because it needs internet permissions. Um, same concept as when you use the web view. Um, when we looked at, we downloaded a, I believe we downloaded an image at one point, and a couple weeks ago we looked at the web view, showed an internet website. Um, and we have to give in the Android manifest the permissions for internet in order for this TCP UDP application will work. It's the same concept, actually. Instead of going out to the internet, though, it's going to an IP, a specific IP address, a specific port. And the port actually works the same. We have port numbers on, and they're the same numbering scheme on the Android phone as they would be on a personal computer. Implement the UDP and the TCP functionality separately, run and debug. And voila, you can actually create that program on a uh, Android phone. Um, these are supplemental lectures, actually, that um, I'll be uploading. They're not up there yet, but I'll be uploading them in the lecture directory. So along with the concept of sockets, we've got threads as another abstraction. So today's lecture is all about UDP, TCP, sockets, and threads, and these kind of interesting client-server type of topics. Um, every process, every program that runs on the Android is actually in its own thread. Um, which is the same concept as the Unix operating system. So you create an application that uses a background thread as a UDP server to receive messages from a UDP client. What do you have? You sort of have a text messaging program. <laughs> when you are waiting for messages to come in, you have a yeah, everybody's a server and everybody's a client, essentially, in a UDP test message type of environment. So in terms of our hello threads example in this particular case, the server can be started and the server address might be, you know, this arbitrary address here. And uh, this might actually be running in the background because we have full Unix capabilities in terms of processes and the process abstraction works the same way. And I'm not going to go repeat operating systems processes. That would be way too tedious for you. 
But think of the pro concept. If you had a background server running on the phone, you can have it connect and then send notifications to the notifications window, or even, even better yet, just send toast messages out and say, hey, you got a new text message. Hey, uh, you got a new, and not use any of the cellular, you could actually create your own messaging system that would run over the cellular network, that would run over, you know. And so, you know, let's say you were too cheap to sign up for text messaging. <laughs> and actually, believe it or not, there are some companies that do this, that don't use, they're not using a text messaging SMS service. They're using, you know, voice over, well, they're using text over IP, essentially, which is UDP packet packets that are created are sent back and forth between these fake addresses. So you can get a number and you can send a message to the number and the number works from a real phone, it works from a regular phone because the number is just on your on your phone, you're just sitting there waiting for incoming UDP packets to a particular port that you've set up and it's a background process that's running that's waiting for the packets to show up. And so you have clients that just send you the packets. So as long as the client can send and all programs that use text messaging send you can actually intermix the UDP packets and get them from SMS clients and then just have the packets translated. And then you know, read the information out of the packet and voila, you've got a free text message service. <laughs> Which, you know, if you go out there and you take a look, there's a lot of free text messaging services running in a very similar kind of fashion. Uh, you know, they have different bells and whistles on them and different capabilities. Um, but anyway, here's a, the layout, how you would put together, and this would be, again, for a background process, but this would be for the UDP or the TCP example, but looking at threads. <coughs> so the text view down here that shows the sent message from the UDP client, so sent a message from the UDP client down here. And then we have a text view on the top that uh, changes from starting server to server started. You know, it's kind of optional. You, know, you don't really need that. It, it, unless you bring this to the foreground, you're really not going to see it. So you know, perhaps you might want to update the status. And then we have the text view here that shows the IP address of the server you know, needed for the UDP client. So if you were testing this. Otherwise, you'd have to figure out some way of broadcasting that IP address. Or maybe it would be a hard set IP address that someone would use to, to say, here, send it to this phone. So the way that the application structure would sort of work if you were putting this together in an Android environment <coughs> is you'd have the main activity, you'd have the server thread, and then you'd have the UDP client, so the server and the client. In the main activity on the onCreate method, we know from the main activity, it's the starting point, it's the main of the entire activity. We would create the thread, and we would have a constructor that would pretty much open the socket. If the socket was successful, we have server started. If not, we try it again. We do a try and catch and we put a message out that says no more ports available or something or something failed. And then we find and display the IP address for where we're sitting, which is going to be the IP address of the phone that the server is running on. And then we would send a message back. So we'd have a message handler that was set up to go and say that, hey, there's a server out there and the server's waiting on at this IP address so that the client would know what to do with it. Um, and then we would have incoming information that would come in to the server that we'd have to parse and have to figure out what to do with that as well. So a message handler would take care of that stuff. In terms of uh, starting the thread, the run method uh, from the server thread, so while the socket was still open, receive the packets, display the message, and send a reply back out. And then from the UDP client perspective, we would read a line from the input what would come in from a, an, in a text box, perhaps, at a box, um, send the line to the server, and then, you know, receive something back from the server from the information that we sent. So this is, would be the same as, a, you know, a, it's, a, it's a thread. It's a thread application of a UDP uh, communication. If you're going to use threads, you're going to use, uh, and if it's, you know, you're going to create a client-server environment, you're probably going to be using UDP or TCP to you know, communicate between the threads. The difference here is that we're not running like a full application. We can take and create a thread, put it in the background, and then the technology is from there. So on an on-click listener, we would also have an on-destroy, close the socket, meaning if you close the application, you know, then uh, the background process should go away. 
and then if the thread was opened up and it was waiting on a port, well then it should close the port, and close the socket, close everything that's associated with it. On the uh, on-click listener, we want to clear, clear the last message and uh, set the buffer so it's got the current information that was recently received. And uh, this is all the information that would be in Hello Threads as an application, and this would be in the UDP client. You can actually run them both on the same same device because the threads running, the uh, Hello Threads is running in the background. So what does it mean to run in the background? We start the app, and then you switch to another app. <laughs> so you could start the app as the server, and then switch to your UDP client and send messages back and forth between yourself. Usually that makes no sense outside of testing, perhaps, but uh, what you want to do is have it loaded on multiple different devices so that you can send messages back and forth between different phones, different people, hopefully. So here's our main activity that would be uh, implemented for the Hello Threads uh, pro sample program that I'm describing here. The class members, <coughs> we would have the text view, whether it's running, you know, my IP address field, the last message that was put in would be some information that was on there. The button that would be, uh, you know, to clear. In fact, this is the GUI items refresher memory. It ends up in here. It's the button that we've got clear on it. The text view that's showing us the IP address of the server and the server status. The on creates. Uh, and the handler, will look at the handler on the next page, but the uh, on create method uh, to get the handlers. Uh, find view by ID, you know, all of the GUI items and get them, you know, from the XML layout that you have that you've got R dot something created for each one of the IDs that are the components that you've identified on the UI interface. Take that, find it by the ID, parse it out, put it into each one of the local objects that's associated with um, those elements. And same thing that you would normally do in, in any other type of application. And then um, Create the thread. So the, ser the, ther the server thread is a new thread is going to equal the new server thread, which is just going to be a new instance of this object for the server thread. And the instance of the object is going to create a socket and it's going to sit there and join. So essentially, what you're doing instead of going, you know, using a thread library, you're creating an instance of an object, and uh, this new server thread object that you're creating is performing the um, socket abstraction and it's performing all of the protocols that we've looked at so far and it's a thread you know because everything that runs on this phone think of it like Unix everything runs in the form of a thread so start the thread by going my thread dot start and uh, the server the server thread abstraction um, you know it, it is a thread so I mean we're running a start on it to say make it active Register the unclick the listener for the clear button. So when the user clicks the clear button, it clears out the messages. Implement the uh, on destroy. So we have a my thread dot close the socket on the object. So we're going to just tell my my thread to close the socket when we're done using it. And then on the on click listener, clear the last message that was in the queue. So the handler here that we have defined on the next page. Here's the handler that we're looking at. So the handler is the one that's going to handle the message exchange that's going back and forth. And this is kind of a nice breakout, actually, of a typical implementation of this type of program. Um, so the handler, you'd want to put together a handler to handle the messages. So the message handler here is doing a case switch, and the sw switch is going to be on a message what, what was received. And if it was a packet that came in, do this. Is it running? Is it an IP address? You know, what is it that we're looking at in terms of the message? So, on the handler itself, we're being sent, we're sending the handle message, the message, as the parameter. So the message comes in, we do a message, we figure out what's inside of the message. In case a packet, you know, it's a packet that came to us, a brand new packet. We would say incoming message is going to be equal to a string, you know, and we're going to typecast this to a string or object upcast it message dot object and then the last message dot set text to the incoming message so the little text box that we had on the screen we're going to set the text to this message that we came that came in otherwise if it's if it's running 
then uh, we're still going to take the socket status from this and we're going to strip it from the message that object at, into a string and then we're going to set the text to whatever happens to be running in terms of the socket status. And then uh, on the IP address, if it's an IP address that comes in, well, we're going to take it and create an, a my IP address object instance that's going to contain the IP address from the message object and uh, process that and set the text to on the on the screen of the server, set the text for the IP address to the IP address that we're pulling from the packet that we've received. So this basic functionality that's going to be handled for all of the packets that are sent, excuse me, that are received, or they could also be, you know, ones that are sent uh, from the server is the packet handler. <coughs> In terms of the server thread implementation, the server thread class is going to extend thread, which is the same way as you do thread programming, because you're going to create a separate thread. But in a C, C++ environment, we would fork a new thread. Here we extend threads, which means this is coming from a, an extension inherited from thread. And um, so our server thread, you know, it is a running program, but it's also considered a thread abstraction in terms of where it's coming from. The class members, well, we're going to have the handler handler. We're going to have a context view, excuse me, a context, which is going to be the link to the application context. And I have another lecture on contexts actually that I don't know if I've, I don't think I've given to you yet. I'll also talk about that in, in a few. Um, Datagram socket, server socket. So this is the UDP socket that uh, we're going to receive, um, you know, receive information at this particular socket. And then we have the um, the constructor here is going, to, is going to take the context and the handler, create a new server thread in terms of uh, the method. So the m context from the parameter is going to be sent to it is going to be equal to the current context, m handler is going to be equal to the handler, equals the handler, and then open up the socket if it's successful and obtain the message. And then print out, and this, this is the status that's going to be on the case switch that's going to be sent in to say it's running, it's an IP address request, or it's a, oh, I don't, can't remember what the other options were, but we're going to send on the previous page, we're going to send uh, this information here, which is going to be parsed in terms of that case switch so that we can kind of see what's going on and what functionality that we have to do from the message handler perspective. And then close the socket, so it allows the socket to be closed. Um, and it's a call from the on destroy to close the socket. And then uh, the void run, and the void run is going to be here actually. Um, so, in terms of getting the IP address, we can run a method to get my Wi Fi IP address, um, which when we run it, we're going to create a new object of Wi Fi Manager. Wi Fi Manager is going to be from the context from the window, get the system service context Wi Fi service. And um, this is actually a service that's running, and it's a parameter that's actually created on the phone. Um, and you can probably see it, uh, you probably have set it many times, or have seen it in the settings menu, which is the same. It's the same service that's running that is used for setting the address, getting the address for other programs, viewing it, um, seeing if you're connected, if you're not connected. And it's not the cellular, it's not the 3G service, it's the Wi-Fi connection. Uh, assuming that we're doing this over IP, which is the only way this works, actually. Um, so the Wi-Fi info is going to be the get connection info. The DHCP info is going to be all well, getting that information from the connection object that we created for the Wi-Fi manager. And then uh, <coughs> the integer my integer IP address is going to be equal to the DHCP IP address that's going to be assigned by the DHCP uh, service that's running. And then go through a loop here to take the bytes and my integer IP address and convert that into bytes because you're going to use that with the server socket um, in terms of the abstraction. And then uh, in our try, we're going to do some exception handling here. We're going to try the network address, get addressed by the quads and then return the IP address. If you can't get the IP address out of there, which means you probably don't have an internet connection, you don't have a DHCP assigned internet address for that particular device you're trying to run this program on, it's going to come back and catch an exception and then log 
Yeah, I'll put something in the DDNS for you to, to log. I can't get my own IP address. I sometimes might actually um, have some security implementation on it that will stop you from getting your own IP address. Um, and a way of testing that actually would be run net CFG, net configure from a telnet prompt. If you get access denied or something of that nature, you know they've got uh, utility shut down completely. Uh, you probably can run an IF config on that as well. Um, but who knows what is actually installed in terms of utilities. But net CFG is installed actually on the, on the system. Uh, so server thread dot run method. So we've got a you know a boolean setup that says is the socket okay? True or false? Uh, true as long as uh, we don't get socket errors and we actually were able to open up and create the socket. So and then we're good. And then uh, while the socket's okay, handle the multiple requests as long as the socket is okay. So the, the while loop instead of going like while true, what we were doing in some of the other ones, we could do while socket okay. <laughs> you know. Because once you know, occasionally we're probably going to lose the socket, especially on a mobile device versus a computer. Uh, there might be other programs running that might uh, interfere with it. And then we have the datagram packet receive packet. This should look familiar. It's the same code as we looked at um, in terms of the datagram packet information. And then on the try, well, here's the same code as well, um, where we've got the uh, server socket dot receive, the receive packet, same identical UDP code that we just looked at. One of the previous, uh, the first lecture I gave you today. So same as UDP server, and then uh, m handler dot. This is the diff, this is the handler that we put in that we didn't have in the previous example, or uh, that I gave you before we started the Android stuff. Obtain the message, and then the message that we're going to get is the packet came, and so when we do the case switch, we can switch it by the packet came and take the packet that came in, parse it, take the information from the byte stream, add it to a string, local string, so that we can keep the message and then put it on the put it on the text box or something like that that's on the screen, text label. Uh, send to target uh, would be another one. Um, you know, something that we're going to put in here to handle a message exchange. And then on the catch, we're going to take the exception here, and uh, if the socket OK is equal to false, uh-oh, we're going to set the... If we get an exception, we're going to set the socket OK to false, even if the socket comes out OK as true from our other check. On an exception, that's the way we're going to stop the loop, essentially. So to the message handler in the main thread is where this message is actually going to go to. So in the Android manifest, <coughs> to be able to use the internet, open the sockets, and to read our own IP address from the Wi-Fi manager, we have to set the internet this is the same one we have to set for the previous UDP TCP. But in order to get the Wi-Fi status, to read the Wi-Fi, which is kind of weird, why they broke it out into two separate ones? To get your own IP address, you actually have to get permission to access the Wi-Fi state. <laughs> then you can get your own IP address. And this is actually from an application point of view. You can actually go to your phone, go to a terminal prompt window, and the terminal prompt will turn this on automatically. The app that's running the terminal emulator is going to turn it on for you. So, and then, so that's why you can like, run an I, IF or IP config depending upon which, I think it's an IF config on, on Unix or a net CFG or something like that. And you can actually see the Wi-Fi address. You can see the wired address as well. Uh, but you do have to allow the permissions from an application perspective in the Android manifest in order for that to work. So, so that was Hello Threads. <laughs> And I uh, have one more, communication activities. <laughs> All right, so what I gave you was a bunch of itsy-bitsy little pieces of building applications that are communicating in a client-server kind of fashion using UDP, TCP, and threads. In this last one for today, to finish out our, uh, if it opens, to finish out our uh, UDP, TCP, slash communications, and threads, we're going to talk about... Well, we've already kind of sort of talked about intents already, and I gave you an intent example where we had one application talking to another application. And it wasn't really an application. We had one window, window A, that was sending, creating an intent and sending a message to window B to come to the front. And then window B sent a message back to window A to so come to the front, window B, and then we switched the windows back and forth. 
which is a way of communicating between two different windows. So we can communicate between different activities as well. And then we're looking at a couple of other things that go above and beyond what I've shown you so far. <clears throat> so the goal here is to create an application that has three activities, main activity and two sub-activities. Because you're probably going to have, um, I don't know, a background server maybe, or you're going to have a foreground something or other. So if you have a background server, you're going to need, you're going to have multiple activities that are going on. You have to figure out, you know, how you're going to design the application and work between them. So introducing two different methods for interactivity communication sort of thing give this sort of like message exchange and uh, direct addressing in terms of IPC interprocess communication from a Unix perspective. That's the underlying implementation. So this really is a thread concept, going back to the concept. So we can do a message return. So message exchange got relabeled to message return and static variables, which what it, when we see static, we think class level variables, <laughs> which is essentially the meaning behind that. So if something has a global state, we can set a variable state, and then the windows can check, each, each one of the windows can check this variable and say, hey, am I supposed to be in the foreground or am I supposed to be in the background? And then the windows activities can decide what they're supposed to be doing depending upon the variable status that's sent. Or we could have one activity send the other activity a message and say, okay, wait a few minutes, I'm going to run now. Uh, because really, in an application when it's running, we only actually have one activity that's running in the foreground, and we can have multiple activities that are running in the background. If you think of this sort of like processes. So via a message, and this is sort of what we saw with the intent, actually. But our intent was just telling the other screen to come, come over here, <laughs> and we went away. So in terms of the via the message exchange, if we type some text in here and pressed OK, <clears throat> the return result would be coming out in terms of this window over here, which is a different activity. And this activity interaction screen over here, and this is the additional. Uh, this window here, ooh, it's a little too big. You can see it better, a little bit better now. It says additional activity up here. We've got a main activity and two sub activities, or two little activities. The One of the subs has a little text box here, it says insert message, press OK. It goes back to the main guy here. And it might invoke an activity by saying, you know, invoke a message. So by clicking this button, it brings up this activity over here. So this is but this is button controlled in this particular example. It doesn't actually have to be, it could be timer controlled, um, or it could be um, event controlled. Um, the intents are mostly in event controlled. Uh, this is button control. It's a little easier to kind of conceptualize in the beginning. <coughs> so to invoke static, we would bring up this static message activity, another sub-activity over here that would invoke an activity. And the activity is doing the same thing. It's creating a message, and the message is down here. And it's changing the value of a shared space, shared variable, um, instead of sending a message back and forth. So we could send messages, or we could have activities that update variables that are going to be shared among everybody else. Because this guy over here, the main activity, can read this variable. And the variable that was sent in was read from the shared space, and the message was ZZZ, and it printed that out on the screen. So you kind of see um, the two kind of representations of the different methods. And it kind of seems. You know, when you first look at this, it sort of seems kind of hooky, but it actually isn't. It's the same thing you would do in a non-Android environment. It's the same thing you would do in a, if you had processes that were trying to communicate in a Linux world. You'd come up with a shared variable that they would all look at, or you'd send a message back and forth between the different processes, depending upon what the thread library was supported uh, by the operating system. So in terms of an overview, we can create two new sub-activities in addition to the main activity. So we uh, are going to set up this particular environment here so we can sort of see how the code works. So we have one main activity and we're going to set up two separate ones. So we create two classes, two .javas, and then we create two layouts, two XML files that go with the .java files. And then we invoke the two new sub-activities uh, by starting the screens. Um, set the context view to the screen, essentially invoke it. 
Um, change the subactivity return results. Read the results of the subactivity from the main activity. So in terms of creating the new subactivity, <coughs> we're just creating a new class. So if we go File, New, Class, copy and paste the on create from the main activity, change the layout to what you want it to look like, copy and paste the main uh, main.xml, the two new layouts. Well, if you had source code files, um, I don't believe, I, I think I do actually have this example that you can co copy and paste the information in. Um, it's as, as simple as um, actually. You could probably do that. At this point, you could probably do that on your own without having to cut and paste anything. <laughs> Drag a couple of bo message boxes on there, put some labels on there, you know. Little text edit text box, you could probably do that. So, uh, so let's see. And uh, this is one of the. This is just a create a new class um, dialog. So we're creating the new class over here called an additional activity. We're clicking on finish. Invoking the sub activity from the main activity. So in here we're using an intent, which is the reason why we looked at intents already. It's just how you're going to get it done is through the concept of the intent. So here we have a, we're going to have an intent get message, which is going to be equal to one. It's kind of like a flag. Have we got the message? We don't have the message. We're going to do that. And this is kind of the same, the on create, this is the same format you've been using for almost every Android application you've created so far. Using an on create, <coughs> uh, going back to the super, going back to the constructor of the base class, setting the context view to the main XML file. Here we, we're getting the text string from the text view box. That's that little entry box where they're typing stuff in. And this is going to be the text view string message. Or excuse me, this is not going to be the one they're typing and that's the edit box. This is going to be the one that shows the message on the target on the, um, the main screen. We have the invoke button, which is going to be the button for the uh, one of the options. And we have the other invoke button. We're going to put the listener. We, have to, we actually have to put the listener on the button. Uh, which we, you've done already, actually, so you should know how to do this one as, as well. Set the on-click listener. So that on a click, we're going to create an intent. The intent's going to be called a message activity intent, which is going to be a new intent that's going to be activity interaction activity dot this and additional activity dot class. So the name of the two main activities are going to be part of the intent, because the intent's got to know about the two sub-windows, essentially. So it knows which one you're talking to, which one should be um, sent the information. So for the interaction between the message return, we can do a start activity for results and the start activity for results method, taking the intent and then the intent get message, which is going to be the, you know, the zero or the one to see if the intent was used or not, or whether it was um, successfully sent, or was it not sent yet, or do we have a new we have a new message to send? So it's like a flag to switch it on and off. And then for the interaction via the static variables here, this would be for the message exchange. For the variable, it's a little bit easier actually because we don't have to use an intent to send the message from one screen to the other um, screen. Instead, here we can invoke a static button. The button itself, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be the button that's going to say this is the variable part of it. And uh, do the on click listener for the button, and the button's going to use an intent, static activity intent. A little bit simpler though, uh, because it's just going to say start activity, static activity intent, which is just going to read the content of a variable. Uh, which is going to be you know, set. So we set a variable by one process. Or one window sets it. The other window, the main window, just reads it instead of having to send a message back and forth. So we don't have to worry about did we send them this message yet? Have they sent them that message? <coughs> so the interaction via the message return. So the invoke button was clicked. If uh, you know if if it was returning a message, the start activity for result message. This is the method call that's going to be used for the message exchange technique. So the on click button, you can put something, you know, essentially on the OK button clicked. The intent is going to be the new intent and create a new intent. Put the message in the intent, set the results to the activity dot results OK intent. 
know, to, to air check it essentially. So build an intent and return the result message. And then on the activity result method, if the case was the intent get message, then return, you know, create a string return message was going to be equal to the data that get extras, which is going to be the information. That's going to be the return message. That's going to be on the, uh, you know, that's going to be received. So this receives the message. So this is part of the main activity. This is on the sub-activity part, or packing it up, sending the return message along back with the intent information so that the main activity can pull that out of the message and use that as the return information. So interaction via the message return as a sub-activity for the message return. So when the OK button is clicked, you return the main activity within the result message via the intent, done the same way, except for you're stripping out the main activity. So the part in red here is just showing you the new part, well, the different part. So the intent dot put extras is putting the return message in on the end of the message. And then you're sending the results, the result and the finish, and finish with the particular activity. So set result activity dot result okay, and then along with the intent. So you're sending them both together. So propagates back to the main activity via the on activity result. So what you're doing is micromanaging the activity and checking the activity and the change of the activity and the receiving of the message so that you can monitor when a, a message has been sent and then when the return message has been sent or received. In the main activity, you can receive the result message from the sub activity by overriding the on activity result. So on an activity result, you override it so that you can print out the message, the result message or something that was received. So the on activity result, these are built-in methods that are part of the, um, you know, the object in terms of the inheritance. Um, <coughs> so the case might be the intent get message, and then the result's going to be uh, create a string result, return message, which is going to be equal to the data.getExtra. So it's just similar fashion to what we've been looking at so far in terms of reading the message from the, the, uh, from the intent. And this one, in this particular method that's going to process by the main activity that's going to process the on activity result, it's going to print a toast message out to the screen, and the toast message is going to have the return message in there. Otherwise, it's going to print out an error and say, hey, we didn't get anything back from you. So we didn't think that you sent something. So via the static variables, and you can see this is not hairy, it's just kind of um, working with the intent and making sure that you're appending the message correctly and you're actually you know, receiving it, parsing the information correctly, and you're you know, checking the different cases of the intent status to make sure that everything works properly. Because it's not an automatic guarantee, it's sort of like um, UDP, it's not guaranteed. Um, with the variables, looking at a static variable implementation from the main activity, you have a start activity, and you're starting the activity on the intent. And uh, from the sub activity point of view, we're creating that message. So the static storage dot message is going to be equal to the message. So save the result to the static variable, and then over here we're just going to read the static message. So static message text view dot set text to this message. And this message is just going to be shared, so this person can read it, write to it, this person can read and write to it, and these are the main activity and then the sub-activity. A little easier. So most people would go with a static variable. However, it doesn't work for all situations. Uh, for sending messages back and forth, it works great, but what if you wanted to open up another window? You wanted to open up one of the sub-activities and have the sub-activity do something as a result of the message that it received, you'd have more flexibility with a message exchange environment versus a shared variable. So shared variable is nice when you're sending text messages back and forth between, or you're sending, passing information back and forth between the different screens or sub-activities. Um, so it's, I would call it a lighter weight version. So. so the interaction via the static variables <sighs> by defining a public static variable. Both activities can share the static variables and uh, create a new class. We call it a static storage. So we have file new class. Same package as the other Java files. We can create a new uh, static storage which is going to keep track of our string. It's going to be a public static string message. 
And uh, static sort of using the same context as in C and C++, although this is Java. It's actually using the same context in Java as well. It creates uh, it's class level instead of, it opens up the view, the view essentially of that data instead of an instance level. Uh, so the subactivity using a static variable, when the OK button is clicked, you save the result message in the static variables and shared, that's shared between the two different activities so that you can use the information. And uh, this is kind of a <coughs> some sample code that would look at that, the edit text, the, you know, the information that was put into the text box, the OK button, finding the button, getting the activity on the button, so setting the on-click listener on the click, take the information that's in the text, excuse me, that's in the edit text, and copy it, you know, string is going to be the edit text .get text to string and copy it to the storage.message. The storage.message is going to be this class that we created, so it's going to be another object, and the object is going to be, it's a public static string message that we're setting in there, so it's going to be visible visible between the different classes, because it's all part of the same project. Which is kind of an interesting note to, to make that's not in a lecture, is that this, all of these um, activities are within the same project. <laughs> Sending an activity to something that's not in the same program, that's in a different program state, it's practically impossible, unless you set some global parameter on the phone, which is why databases and static files come into handy. Except for files, it's harder to share the information because you actually have to send the contents out and put it somewhere and have another program copy the information. When you're using the SQL database, the tables aren't shared among the different applications. But there's some tricks that you can use to create some stuff that's used among multiple. But sharing data between different applications is kind of tricky and not was something that was not really built into the original design um, and probably for security purposes I would assume you wouldn't want someone reading and writing and mult altering data that was created by other applications so um, you do have the capability though of sharing between applications but the activities that belong to a certain application are belonging to that application they're not visible outside you can't use an intent between different applications is my point so. So interactions via the static variables to continue with the concept. The main activity access, <coughs> the uh, static variables in the on resume. On resume is going to set, uh, super on resume is going to set essentially to get from, set the text from the static message text view, the message that's being sent to the shared variable on the main window, set the text view to equal you know, so it contains the message that's in the storage static storage that was created. In the Android manifest, you add the two subactivities to the, anif to, to the um, Android manifest by saying that uh, add, these are the two, the static message activity and the additional activity. Uh, the same way as you added the main activity. And then um, you create basically the labels for the activities so that when you send the intents, it knows where to find it as a, the entry into the global environment space. So. And then the application can actually run those windows. It's aware of it. So. <coughs> and then you sent them as activities. So these are the activity tags that are creating the two sub-activities that are parts of the main program, main activity. The main activity would also be in manifest as well. In terms of the string.xml file, adding the activity names used, and here we have uh, ad adding the additional activity and the static message activity. Why that is underlined, I have no idea. Probably should not be underlined. It was a typo. Uh, but uh, they should both look the same with no underlining. Uh, so this would be the string that would be used uh, internally when we refer to that act activity versus that activity. If you're going to use strings. So that was the last part of our look into um, Android communications, which is the theme for this week. Threads, UDP, TCP, um, the use of intents to share information between processes and threads, which was kind of the focus. 
I put this out on the website. I thought maybe I would explain it a little bit. Uh, this is the CSLO essay. Uh, so those people who are watching this for content can tune out now. Those people taking the ITU class can now listen. <laughs> so stop tuning out and start listening. Uh, what, what do we have going on here? This is the CSLO essay. And the essay itself is due at the very last day of the course, which is May 1st, actually. Uh, this is March, April. So we have two months left. So we have a lot more topics to cover, too. Uh, so don't stress on this one. It is worth 25 points of your grade. I do want you to put in a two to three page double space, which is what, one or two pages single spaced? Mm -hmm. Double space it. You're going to select one of the topics down here. And uh, you have to include at least three reference citations, which means you're probably going to want to do some research. If you do some research on the internet, you'll find a ton, a ton of Java a ton of Android SDK information. And uh, the easiest topic of this entire thing is this last one, number 10, that says select an Android-related topic of your choice and <laughs> write an essay using that selected topic. For those of you who don't like any of the other topics, you may just pick your own topic. What are you doing? You're investigating features. So I'm not going to run through them all. However, I'll just give you kind of a breakdown. You can talk about basic concepts if you want to. And uh, this is a writing assignment, by the way. I don't want you to, unless you can, you can put in source code snippets and things. And you can you know, show examples. But I don't want you to write an Android program or cut and paste an Android program off of the internet and slap on a label that says CSLO essay on it and turn it in. I'm not going to necessarily meet, the, meet the, the, the expectations of this assignment. Instead, I want you to, to do, treat this like a research paper and come up with some ideas describing, let's say, how to use the SDK and the other development tools, explaining basic concepts. You know, you can pretend like, you know, you're teaching the course and this is how you should use the SDK. Or this is how you should install the SDK. Or this is how the SDK works or what it's useful for. And you can combine topics if you'd like as well. That's why number 10 is kind of a nice option here. Number 10, you can come up with your own topic completely. Or what I can sort of see students doing is combining a couple of these together. Because how are you going to come up with two or three pages of information unless you're really long-winded about the install? So you probably could install and then go through how to create a Hello World program or something. Or you could talk about text messaging or something. Or maybe if you found one of the assignments that you did for the course, and I've already gone through the assignments I did that last week. Um, or the week before. Did I do that last week? I think I did last week. Uh, and I, I, I realized I didn't have a CSLO essay created last week. So that's why I created it. It's out there on the bhacker.com website. We'll be in the LMS shortly. Uh, but long story short, after you've gone through some of the programming assignments, you might just have a light bulb click on or something, or you might have something interesting you want to write about. Use this as an opportunity. So you could research it and say, you know, how many different ways are there to create a UDP application, or what kind of UDP applications are out there in Android programs? You know, how does the TCP, you know, compare to Linux and Android? What are the differences in the capabilities, or something, or in the message exchanging, or something? You can totally customize this. Pick a topic of your choice. These are kind of generic, and these are topic suggestions. So, you know, explaining how to acquire additional resources and security information. Well, you could just do security. You could change the question around. What are the security features? Actually, the security features are kind of interesting because you have to allow permissions for almost everything. You could actually do a research paper on all of the different permissions that you could possibly set. Uh, I know it would be a good learning experience, actually. Or you could talk about the whole concept of the keys and the maps that we talked about last week terms of using map programs and you know, why is it that you have to have a map key and that whole you know process of getting one or you could talk about the complexities of SMS messaging or email um, or you could get into the SQL Lite database features and talk about the database you know capabilities or if you wanted to you could probably figure out well how can I have one two couple of applications you know use the same tables maybe somehow if I could possibly get that to work uh, you know, is it even possible? You know, you can explore different options, different features. Use this as an opportunity to go in one direction or another, and uh, write a research paper that explores those different options. Very, very tempting. 
when you find information to cut and paste. Don't do that. Write it in your own words. Do not cut and paste information you find on the internet and put it in and say, hey, here's my paper. Because what you're going to find is a bunch of tutorials. Oh, this is a perfect tutorial. Look at that. It's three pages. It fits. Perfect. Uh, so try, try to write it yourself. You actually learn more about it this, you know, as well. So. Questions about the CSLO essay. New? Then we're done for today. Next week we'll have a totally different topic to talk about. <laughs> but that was today's. Okay, see you next week. TA ever show up? <laughs>